Marvin Gaye's album, What's Going On, is a masterpiece for so many reasons, but it almost didn't happen. It's the culmination of a decade of incredible music and marks the clear end of multiple eras. Plus, James Jamerson is on bass, laying down one of the greatest bass lines ever recorded. But even then, there's a crazy story with that. Today, we're talking about the 1971 album, What's Going On by Marvin Gaye. We'll talk about the history leading into this album, the musical influences in it, the story of how it came to be, or almost didn't, and see what makes this song and album so timeless. Marvin Gaye was part of the Motown machine. Motown, of course, being the Detroit-based record label run by Barry Gordy. Motown is its own history and requires an entirely separate video, but Motown played a huge part in racial integration of popular music. For example, I'm sure you know this song. It's a duet between Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell. What do you think it's gonna be? Which one? Here we go, ready? That's all you get. That's all you get, YouTube. What you got? That's right, ain't no mountain high enough. Motown had a ton of crossover hits that white audiences loved. In the 1960s, they had a huge roster of artists and a massive catalog. Much of the instrumentation on these records was all the same people, all done in-house with different artists singing on top. For example, Ain't No Mountain High Enough, the rhythm section was the Funk Brothers, with James Jamerson on bass. Now, the Funk Brothers were a collective of musicians responsible for most of the instrumentation you hear on Motown recordings. I mean, not that you'd know that because they were never credited. But the Funk Brothers recorded for The Temptations, The Supremes, The Four Tops, Marvin Gaye, of course, Smokey Robinson, Stevie Wonder, The Jackson Five, and more. Now, I'm a bass player, so I'm a little biased, but I think it's safe to say the most famous Funk Brother was James Jamerson. Jamerson's bass lines are some of the best bass lines ever recorded. He's got a specific style, definitely jazz influenced because there's a lot of chromatic notes in there, but it's also very syncopated and very funky. His bass lines, they just complement the vocal in an incredible way. You could isolate just the bass and the vocal and the song would still feel great. Here, let me show you. Here's that same song, Ain't No Mountain, but with just the vocal and the bass. Come on. It just perfectly weaves in with the vocal. It's funky, it's driving it along. He's hitting enough melodic stuff that you can tell what the chord is. So you can just do bass and vocal and he's filling out enough rhythmically and harmonically that he's providing everything you need for the vocal. Here's another one. There's so much feel, there's so much harmonic stuff in there, there's so much rhythmic stuff. Again, you can add in those other things, but you almost don't need them. Here's yet another, and it's one of the craziest ones. For once in my life, I have someone who needs me, someone I've needed so long. What's crazy about this to me is that Stevie Wonder songs, he's got so many chords in there. James Jamerson's bass lines are some of the best ever recorded. And if you're a bass player, you know who he is. And if you don't, go listen to James Jamerson. What are you doing? This bass I have right here is the first bass I've ever owned, and I turned it into my Jamerson bass. I changed the pick guard and the hardware, and I keep flat wound strings on it to get that Jamerson sound. I love this thing. To dive even deeper into James Jamerson, go check out the full extended edit of this video at patreon.com slash diggingthegreats. There are whole other sections to this video that don't fit on YouTube, so suffice it to say, Patreon's where it's at. Motown is some of the best music ever recorded, and it was also a gigantic machine, cranking out hit after hit. James Jamerson was the primary bassist, along with Bob Babbitt. Marvin Gaye was a star artist in the Motown machine as well. Of course, with this gigantic machine, you can have some issues. Namely, the musicians not getting credit, like the Funk Brothers, and also artists feeling stuck creatively, feeling like they can't make the music they want to make. And that's exactly where Marvin Gaye found himself in 1970. 
Marvin's brother, Frankie, had just returned from the Vietnam War and told Marvin all the horrors he had experienced. Of course, there were issues at home in the United States too. Poverty, drug abuse, Nixon, police brutality, racial tensions, all clashing with the 60s hippie idealism, as well as Motown's slick, polished musical machine, which was made up of predominantly black artists and musicians. On a personal level, Marvin's friend and singing partner, Tammy Terrell, had just stopped performing due to a brain tumor, and his marriage was falling apart. He was depressed. As Marvin himself said, in 1969 or 1970, I began to reevaluate my whole concept of what I wanted my music to say. I was very much affected by letters my brother was sending me from Vietnam, as well as the social situation here at home. I realized that I had to put my own fantasies behind me if I wanted to write songs that would reach the souls of people. I wanted them to take a look at what was happening in the world. So in 1970, when Obi Benson of the Four Tops presented Marvin with a song he was working on with fellow Motown songwriter Al Cleveland, Marvin cleaned it up, added a few things here and there, and the song What's Going On was born. This song was produced by Marvin himself and arranged by Motown arranger David Vandepit. It features the Detroit Symphony Orchestra as well as several members of the Funk Brothers. Now, we're gonna talk specifically about the bass in just a moment, but let's dive into the multi-tracks and see just how beautiful this song is. So first, let's start with the drums. Now, when I think of this song, the main thing I think of is those bongos. Like, I feel like you could just take the bongos and the bass and Marvin's vocal, and that's like the core of the song. Everything else sounds incredible, but if you had to get rid of everything else, bongos, bass, and Marvin's vocal, that's sort of the main driving stuff on this song. We've of course got Jamerson's line. That's so active, and because that is so active, you have the other instruments, like guitar here. Listen to what guitar is doing at the beginning. Just sort of strumming those chords. Nothing too crazy. We got vibraphone in there. Keeping it simple. Same thing with piano. Of course, we have saxophone at the very beginning. Now, interesting thing on this sax line, it's actually not super intentional. The sax player was just sort of messing around. He wasn't intending that to be the intro, but Marvin loved it, so he ended up keeping it. Come on. Another interesting unintentional sort of thing is Marvin's lead vocal. They recorded two different takes, and then what the engineer did is he planned on sort of A-B testing it with Marvin. And he took one take and he panned it hard left. And then he took the other one and he panned it hard right. And the intention was, hey Marvin, check this out. You know, what, do you like this one? Do you like this one? But they ended up both playing at the same time, panned hard like that. And Marvin loved both of them. So they kept both of them. Oh, what's going on? Now, most of the time, what's going on? they match. Yeah, what's going on? Or mostly. Oh, what's going on? Oh, In the meantime. But there's right times on, when it doesn't. Right on, right on baby. And those are two totally different takes. I love that effect. Now, we need to talk about the bass. This is some of James Jamerson's finest work. The way this bass line moves around the chord changes, complements the vocal, and stands on its own is truly incredible. There's not a lot of repeating licks. It feels like a very organic bass line, which is right in line with Jamerson's style. But there are two crazy facts about James Jamerson and his bass line. For one, how it was recorded. The story goes that Jamerson was playing at a local Detroit club when Marvin was recording this and insisted that he needed Jamerson to lay down the bass right then. So Marvin drove to the club and insisted that he come record with him right away. The only problem was James Jamerson was exhausted and also drunk. So he recorded this bass line laying on the floor flat on his back. Now that's the part of the story that gets told often. Jamerson drunk lying on his back playing this iconic bass line. But what doesn't get talked about enough is that he was also reading music. Here's what arranger David Vandepit had to say. Producers would say to him, James, you remember the bass line you played on such and such a tune? And he'd say, oh yeah, and he'd play it. Then they'd say, well, that's the kind of feel I want on this tune. Do you think you could do that and spice it up a little bit? Sometimes it could get really out of hand and sound like a bass concerto. On what's going on though, he just read the part down like I wrote it. 
He loved it because I had written Jamerson licks for James Jamerson. This blows my mind. On the one hand, you might think, oh, he's not actually making up the line on the song, he's reading it, like that's a bad thing. But to me, that makes me respect him as a musician even more. On all the other Motown stuff, he's coming up with those lines, but here's David Vandepit giving him a bass line, note by note, in the style of himself, and he's drunk on the floor, sight reading this, and killing it. For context, I'm completely sober, standing up, and here's me sight reading this bass line exactly as it's written. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I can't talk either. Here we go. What? Come on. No, no, I'm out. I can't do it. I mean, I know this song, so that's what I'm leaning back on is what I know of it. But that line is insane to read. All of those syncopations. It's crazy. This is some of James Jamerson's finest work. Some of David Vandepit's finest work. Same for Marvin, same for the other songwriters. In other words, this is the Motown machine firing on all cylinders, making some incredible music that means something. It's not quite a protest song. It's naming crazy stuff happening in the world and asking what is going on. Lyrically and musically, this song, I don't know, it feels like a relaxing drink at the end of a long week where you open up and decompress with a friend. Except the week is the entire decade of the 60s and the friend is the entire Motown machine. There was just one problem. Barry Gordy, the head of Motown, he hated it. He reportedly called it the worst song he's ever heard in his life and thought the jazzy sounding bridge sounded old. When Marvin Gaye told him he wanted to do a protest record, he said, Marvin, don't be ridiculous. That's taking things too far. But the head of A&R at Motown, Harry Balk, heard the record and believed in it. He went behind Gordy's back to the VP of sales, Barney Ailes, and convinced him to release the record. His argument was that Marvin Gaye had made the company millions, and if they didn't release this, they'd have nothing new from him to release. So Barney Ailes ordered 100,000 copies of What's Going On, just the song, mind you, and these sold out in four days. Of course, at that point, Barry Gordy came around. He then bet Marvin that he couldn't deliver the rest of the album in 30 days, which of course he did. The rest of this album is what's known as a song cycle, a term meaning a group of songs that are meant to be listened and performed together as one piece. Sure, this album had singles, but if you listen through, these songs connect through direct segues. Themes are repeated either musically or lyrically, and at the very end, it reprises the song that started the album, What's Going On. What's Going On, the album, feels like an extended version of the song. It's one continuous idea flowing directly into different areas like the environment, inner city life, drug abuse, and a disillusionment with the state of the world. But like I said, this doesn't feel like a protest album. It's like a drink at the end of a chaotic week, a look back, a calm reflection on the insanity of the world. Not furious at the state of the world, but heartbroken. This album is at the end of an era in multiple ways. It's the end of the hippie idealism of the 1960s. It's the beginning of a new era for Marvin Gaye. But it's also the end of an era for Motown. While this was Motown's biggest selling album up to that point in 1971, and the Funk Brothers received credit for their work for the very first time on Motown, just one year later, 1972, the label abruptly moved to Los Angeles, leaving behind many artists and musicians like the Funk Brothers and James Jamerson. The 60s Motown machine was abruptly shut down. Of course, Motown continued, as did James Jamerson, but it was different. This album, What's Going On, caps off the decade of the 60s, even though, yes, it's in 71, the classic Motown sound, James Jamerson's prime era, and Marvin Gaye's first big era. And the craziest thing is, this song and album is timeless. The songwriting, the arranging, Marvin's vocal, Jamerson's bass, or Bob Babbitt who played on the second half of the album, and of course, what the lyrics are speaking about. It's tragic that this song and album are still so relevant to our world today, over 50 years later. But this album is here as a reflective pause. No, you're not crazy. The world is a little nuts, and it's also a little hopeful. We've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Do yourself a favor, take 35 minutes out of your day, put on some headphones, and give this album another listen through. 
It's a classic for a reason. Speaking of the end of an era and the beginning of a new one, there are two other artists who came up in Motown who went through a similar experience, but for both of them, the challenge was maturing into an adult artist after having started out in music very young. And both of these artists share one song in common. I'm of course talking about Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson and the song I Can't Help It. But I'm out of time. For that story, you gotta click here.